Podcast. Welcome back. You know, I've received quite a number of requests to do a video on Smith & Wesson handguns, that is, specifically Smith & Wesson revolvers. Well, the big logistical difficulty for me was that I don't currently have a Smith & Wesson revolver of my own. But, thanks to my good neighbor Mort, uh, he lent me his uh, beautiful Model 25 45 Colt in an N-frame Smith & Wesson. So, <coughs> Before we take a look at it, maybe I'll just tell you a little bit about my background with Smith & Wesson revolvers. In the mid-70s, I had the great privilege of being able to attend the Smith & Wesson Armorers School down at Roosevelt Avenue in Springfield, Massachusetts, right at the factory. Now, it's a two-week two school where you are embedded uh, with uh, nothing but Smith & Wesson uh, revolvers the entire time you were there at that particular time when revolvers were the king of the hill and Smith and Wesson was without question king of the uh, police market in those in those two weeks I learned how to uh, completely assemble from scratch uh, and when I say assemble we're talking about hand fitting a uh, revolver from scratch using I believe we had uh, six we had six bare naked uh, frames and uh, with nothing more than barrels attached to them and side plates attached and from there we proceeded to learn how to uh, fit and assemble each one of those uh, revolvers and get them working according to Smith & Wesson standards. And uh, in the following week we worked on literally uh, dozens of uh, guns which were brought in from the factory that uh, you know, needed to be um, in one way or another. They needed to have service. Uh, they were they were new production guns that had gone through initial assembly, uh, but they had uh, various uh, defects that needed to be identified and corrected. And uh, it was a fabulous it was a fabulous environment where you know a, a group of about twenty of us, I believe it was, from all over the world, from different police departments and uh, military. Uh, the guy that sat on my, uh, sat beside me at my bench was a big uh, Navy SEAL with a, he had a, he had a 19 gallon uh, cowboy hat uh, with a big handlebar mustache, quite a character. But we went through, we went through this process uh, for over two weeks, 80 hours of uh, learning uh, the craft of uh, building a Smith & Wesson wheel gun. So, <coughs> And in the ensuing years, uh, for, for over 10 years, I worked on our own department's handguns. And that meant that every time a police officer came to qualify, he submitted his uh, gun to me before, the, uh, before he went uh, home for the day. Uh, after, he had, after he had fired his uh, course, he submitted his gun to me. I tore it down, went through the whole thing completely, cleaned it inside and out and then gave it back to them and repaired anything that needed to be repaired. Now they're a very durable, they're a very durable gun. And I can tell you that having worked on uh, many hundreds of them uh, many, many times over the years, over those 10 years, um, that they are extremely durable and they suffer very, very little wear. Um, but they do have certain, they do have certain wear points uh, that can over time loosen up and uh, cause difficulties. Uh, they also have certain they also have certain problems should they unfortunately get dropped and certainly in a, in a police officer's capacity uh, you know it's a rough and tumble environment out there on the street uh, and they get they get banged around and uh, quite frequently uh, certain things happen where the cylinders needed to be uh, strapped up again uh, is what, what's called uh, refitting the cylinder, uh, correcting end shake and all sorts of all sorts of things. But my purpose is certainly not to presume that I can teach you anything that I had learned over those 80 hours because it's a comprehensive, you know, it's a comprehensive uh, machine. Uh, the, uh, whatever you do with one, whatever you do with one part affects the whole. Uh, this, it, nothing can be, nothing can be segregated out uh, and, and simply uh, viewed in, in a limited uh, scope. So you really have to understand that all I can show you at this point is essentially how to open the gun up, how to clean it out, uh, how to how 
to look for uh, and identify any faults in the gun that need to be corrected by a suitable uh, craftsman, somebody who uh, is either a, an armorer, a trained armorer, or the best, the best thing of all is certainly to send it simply to the factory, uh, back to Springfield, Mass., and they will, they will fix it up in perfect working order and ship it back to you the way it was uh, intended originally. So I want to dig into this gun with you and show you what we got. So let's take a look. Oh, would you look at this now? How would you like to play patty fingers with that, huh? Well, we're going to do that. So this is a model 25-5 Smith & Wesson end frame revolver chambered in 45 Colt. Now that's a beauty. Uh, this is the same frame, by the way, this end frame is the same frame that was used in the uh, model 29 uh, 44 Magnum for so many years, the dear, Dirty Harry gun. This is a six and roughly a six and a half inch barrel, measures a little bit longer to the uh, forcing cone to the uh, gap. Um, but I want to go over all the nomenclature also because you know Smith & Wesson has been around for many many years for you know over 150 years and uh, you know they have their own nomenclature which differs from uh, other manufacturers and uh, you know it's it's improper it's always improper to call a part by uh, some other company's uh, designation so we're going to learn that as well as we learn uh, how to open it up and strip it so let's get into it now in the course of uh, fitting and assembling and repairing these guns an armorer uses many tools inclu including uh, certain uh, devices which are used to uh, center the uh, yoke uh, to uh, drive pins, remove pins, uh, center uh, the, the center rod, uh, all sorts of things. But the primary instrument is a simple screwdriver. Now it's got to be a good fitting screwdriver. This particular screwdriver doesn't look like anything special. This is not a uh, this is not a, a Grace a hollow ground screwdriver. This is a screwdriver, however, I've been using for over 45 years, uh, close to 45 years on Smith & Wesson handguns. Uh, it is, I, I, I hardened the screwdriver after I shaped it to fit uh, only Smith & Wesson screws. It's never been used on anything ex except for a Smith & Wesson uh, revolver, and I use it on nothing else. This blade fits a Smith & Wesson uh, screw perfectly, regardless of the size frame and it was uh, heat treated and hardened so uh, this and it's also polished on the edges and you'll find out uh, why as we go along it's got a straight shank it's got nothing there's no there's no bulbous uh, protuberances uh, such as you would find on something like this which can get in the way uh, it's got to have a slender shaft and that's what I recommend this is the sort of thing which is used at the factory by uh, anybody who works there the other thing that you should have is a good uh, parts cleaning brush. Where you can get these now, I don't know exactly. I've had this one again for, you know, since I went to the school, I've got another couple. Uh, it wears down a little bit and I give it a haircut every now and then, but that works and serves the purpose just the way it ought to. It was given to me at the factory. Um, you know, simple mineral oil. When I say mineral oil, mineral oil, not CLP, not ballastol mineral oil just plain plain mineral oil it's just that's the basis for which every other oil in the world uh, machine oil is made uh, it doesn't need any additives it doesn't need any cleaning cleaning uh, provisions oil by the way uh, is a cleaning agent of its own if you put oil on something uh, you know dirt will flow away so it it is also a very very good uh, carbon cutter and you should have a good uh, you should have a good a soft flannel uh, oil treated rag treated with mineral oil and that's used to uh, preserve the nice finish so the first thing we want to do is remove the stocks on a Smith & Wesson with these Goncalo elves uh, beautiful Goncalo elves uh, wood this is called a stock it's not called a grip in the uh, vernacular of the uh, Smith & Wesson trade now their their current offerings may be called grips but these are stocks. Whenever you're working with, whenever you're working with screws on a Smith & Wesson or in any gun, you should cradle the screw, uh, the screwdriver with uh, your thumb, so that you prevent it from sliding out of the screw head. 
when you feel the screw has been completely backed out from its last turn I heard that click then push straight down with the screw uh, and that will push the backside stock off and that removes it safely under no circumstances ever stick a screwdriver in behind the frame and twist it off that's that's a real amateurish thing to do and I've seen countless uh, Smith & Wessons and other other guns to find guns where the wood uh, has got those scars on it and where there's some marks on the frame it's very amateurish uh, remove remove this stock if you know you've pushed the other one off if if this one is stubborn and doesn't want to come off you just simply flip it over and push it off from the other side that's all you need to do through the skeleton so set your set your wood stocks aside now the next the next thing we want to do is to remove we want to remove the cylinder the cylinder is captured and held in place the yoke is held in place by this forward screw now let me identify uh, some things here. <clears throat> if you have a very old Smith & Wesson, uh, pre-19, uh, late 1950s, uh, or a new so-called classic model, uh, you'll see a screw in this uh, position right up here at the very top of the uh, side plate. Uh, but most, most of the uh, revolvers that were made throughout the uh, late 50s, early, uh, all through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and so forth, were made with a three-screw design. It's not better. It's not lesser. It's nothing. It's, it's simply, it's actually an improvement because uh, it, that screw, that screw really didn't do anything except uh, stand out and, uh, you know, snag on things. But anyway, we want to remove, this is the number one position, number two position, number three position. And that's, that's the name of the, that's the name of the screw. However, this screw here is called an, a end shake screw. It's called a yoke screw. That particular, that particular screw uh, retains the yoke. And it's not a crane. If you are if you are in Colt country or in Ruger country, uh, it's called a crane. But if you're on Roosevelt Avenue, uh, we call it a remove that screw. Now, many people, many people discuss whether or not this screw is the same as this screw. They're both crowned and they both look alike. Well, this screw is fitted and married to, I'll show you how it is, but this screw is fitted and married at the factory to the yoke, to the yoke button. So that screw has been mated and married and remains part of that yoke button and keep it aside. Turn the gun over without removing the other two screws. Turn the gun over, open up, open up the cylinder. This is very important. Pay attention. Hold the cylinder in place as you slide the yoke out and forward and never under any circumstances drag it out as a unit you don't ever want to drag it out you're not only going to you're not only going to possibly scar the fine bluing on the on the uh, cylinder and also uh, on the forward portion of the frame but you're going to distort you're going to cause that yoke to be stressed sideways and you're going to bend the relationship that uh, was carefully strapped up when they when they put it together when they first uh, fitted it and assembled it and from that point on you're going to have serious problems with alignment you're going to have cylinder cramping you're going to have du rough double action you're going to have rough single action uh, and it's not it's possibly not going to uh, lock on each one of its uh, charge holes so always again remember it's it's a matter of moving the yoke out from a matter of moving the yoke out from the front of the cylinder while the cylinder stays put lift it all out as a unit okay so let's go over some of the nomenclature here with the yoke this is the uh, yoke stud this is the button of the yoke this is this is the part where the uh, the number one screw uh, holds on to the it, it holds on in a lateral arrangement just like that uh, so that's the front end of that screw, it's a polished front end, and that fits inside the button, and uh, it, it mates and seats on the uh, rear edge of that button. That's the relationship that holds uh, everything tight and in alignment. 
So keep that screw separate. This is the barrel of the yoke. The barrel of the yoke is uh, basically it's a bearing surface which bears not only along its radial uh, two sides, front and rear, but it also bears on the leading edge. Wear and damage to the uh, wear and damage to the uh, yoke barrel will create what's called a cylinder end shake. Um, wear on this portion right here will call, cause what's called yoke end shake. Neither one are repairable by uh, somebody uh, who has not gone to the uh, armor facility, who has not learned the trade, because uh, these, uh, you know, to correct either of these uh, problems is uh, an armorer's uh, situation. There, there is one thing that you can do initially with this, uh, with this relationship here. If you start to uh, have what's called, and I'm going to show you in greater detail later on, but if you begin to have uh, just plain uh, forward shake of, on, on that yoke in the closed position, uh, you, can, you can substitute the number two screw, you can substitute the number two screw for the number one screw, and that uh, will then uh, tighten up some of that tolerance. Uh, so we're going to set that aside. We'll take apart the take apart the uh, other two screws. The two forward screws, the number one and the number two position, are crowned screws. In other words, those are called side plate screws crowned. Uh, the forward one is called the, specifically, it's the same screw, same type of screw, but it's called a yoke screw. The number one screw is a yoke screw. We're going to set these aside separately, segregate it from uh, the number one yoke screw. The rear screw is a shorter length screw with a uh, flat head, and that's a different design if you need to reorder one. And screws can be ordered directly from the Smith & Wesson factory if you should, uh, for any reason, uh, bugger them up. Never, this is another amateur maneuver, never put a screwdriver under here and pry the lid off. Never pry this side plate off. People say, well, how do you do it? It's very simple. You simply take you simply take the you, the palm of your hand. I'm going to turn the camera so you can see exactly what I'm doing. On the side of a padded bench, something which is this is this is it's thinly padded, but it's sufficient. A padded but firm surface. Place your palm of your hand underneath that side plate, and I'm going to turn a little bit so I have room. And you just simply whack it on the side of the bench and it'll drop the side plate into your hand. You'll have two parts there. You'll have the side plate and you'll have the hammer block. The hammer block, the hammer block is a, a very vital part. Never toss it away. I know I, I see clowns that say, well, if you want to improve the single action and double action to get rid of your hammer block, that's one of the safety, very, very important safety feature of the revolver. That prevents the firing of the revolver without the finger being completed, uh, completely back on the trigger. So we'll set that aside. Uh, the side plate is, uh, you'll notice that it has, it has various bright bearing surfaces. Now this, uh, I haven't had this gun apart before. This gun was made in 1976 according to the serial number. And the inside of it, you can see, is, can you see that? It's dry. It's not glistening with oil. Um, there's no rust here. Uh, the gun has been stored in a standard house environment all that time in that same box. Uh, and there's no, there's no rust evident anywhere. This is not stainless steel. Uh, all the, the, the bright marks that were left by the uh, original uh, armor at the factory uh, when he fitted when he fitted these uh, bearing surfaces uh, that's still bright and shiny too these are these are fitted surfaces by the way everything on this gun is hand fitted I can't think of one part as a matter of fact in this handgun which is not hand fitted and most places need to be fitted in more than one place uh, so these two bearing surfaces are, are fitted they receive the studs that are uh, in the gun, the hammer stud, the trigger stud, uh, the rebound slide stud, and the cylinder stop stud. So all those studs are, are captured by these various 
uh, holes be and also the other holes that go through are naturally the screw holes. So we're going to set this aside with the finished side up in an area where it's going to be uh, safe from dropping anything on it. I want to keep my I want to keep my parts together. Um, next thing we want to do is to remove the uh, strain screw. Now the strain screw uh, is subject to a lot of abuse by um, amateurs that I uh, think they can do something that somebody on a uh, somebody in a magazine article told them it was profitable to do. Uh, they will loosen up that strain screw. They will grind off or, or file off uh, the end of the uh, strain screw in order to reduce uh, the uh, trigger pull and hammer pull weight. Don't do that, please. That that's, that leads to nothing more than uh, simply having a, a gun which doesn't fire all the time. Uh, a very uh, a very unreliable gun. If you know this is this is a gun which is designed to, it's a combat piece. It's designed to uh, either do combat with a bear out in the woods or to do combat with uh, somebody on the street. Uh, but you know, it, unless you're using it for punching holes in paper, uh, don't be monkeying around with anything to reduce uh, a few ounces off the trigger pull or the hammer pull, because all you're going to do is end up with a sloppy gun that fails to go off when it's supposed to. And I know the regimens that people use. They they buy they buy a box of ammo and they fire a box of ammo and they keep on loosening up this screw until it gets to the point where it keeps on firing without uh, without malfunctioning. And then they then they set the screw in place with some Loctite and all that stuff. But then they then they get a different box of ammo, or it's a colder day or a warmer day, and the gun doesn't go off. I've seen it happen at the range at the police range. Okay, now. Removing, removing, this, removing this hammer is the, next, is the next step. First thing I want to do is get my, this is my left hand. I want to take the second finger of my left hand. These are, these are, all, these are all tricks which we learned at the factory. Uh, because otherwise, if you don't do it this way, you're not going to get the hammer and trigger out. You want to place your second finger between the cheek, the, the cylinder cheek right here, and the thumb piece. This is known as the uh, thumb piece. The thumb piece and the thumb piece nut. That's that's not a thumb piece screw. That's a thumb piece nut. So you want to place your second finger between those two and push back on the bolt. If you look right, right carefully right here, you'll see that there's a this this bolt comes back. That's what that's what uh, comes back to lock. When that's in the rearward position, it locks the center pin of the cylinder in place uh, and keeps the uh, keeps the cylinder locked in in the frame. When it's forward is when the cylinder can slide, uh, when the cylinder can rotate out of the frame. What you want to do is you want to push back on that bolt to clear. If you notice right here, the back, the tail end of the bolt, there is a, there's a locking surface right here. That's to prevent the hammer from being withdrawn uh, without the cylinder in place. So you want to push back on that uh, thumb piece with that center finger pinch while you're pinching with the with the thumb on top of the hammer that's important if you don't do that you're going to end up you're going to end up scarring and i've seen i've seen evidence you know at the factory they showed us different things and they showed us frames where the corner here was wiped out and destroyed by some worker who didn't pay attention to what he was supposed to do so pinch the pinch the hammer between the second finger of your left hand and uh, the thumb, draw the trigger to the rear with the other hand. Now that you've got the now you've got the hammer uh, past that rear of the bolt, lift straight up with the hammer in the fully cocked position. Lift the hammer straight up and off the stud. That's how you remove the hammer. Let's identify a little bit of the nomenclature of the hammer. This is the hammer nose. It's not a firing pin. This is a hammer nose. And on the hammer nose, you'll notice that there's some, uh, there's some looseness. That looseness is there for a reason. Uh, so it glides into position up and over, up and over the hammer nose uh, bushing in the uh, frame. So that has to be that has to be loose. This is spring loaded. Uh, there, you know, through the years they've had some models which it wasn't always spring loaded, but this one here is spring loaded. This has got the uh, wide target hammer. Sp hammer spur. 
Uh, you'll notice it's color case hardened. This color case hardening uh, is six to seven thousandths of an inch deep. It's very, very thin. You'll notice that there are no there are no surfaces on here where the color case hardening is worn through. Uh, this is this gun has been used actively and it's uh, in, in still in, in terrific condition. Uh, you, there's nothing on this hammer that can ever, ever, ever be modified. You can't use a stone on it. You can't use any, uh, you know, you can't use a Novaculite stone on it or anything like that or a file. You're going to ruin it. You're going to have, this is one of the most costly parts on the gun and you're going to be destroying it. So do nothing with it whatsoever with a stone or a file. This piece right here is called the sear. The sear retracts the hammer in double action mode. If, uh, when, a, when a sear is installed by an armorer, uh, there are three, there are three fit, fitted surfaces. There's the, what's called the long cut, the short cut, and the rear of it underneath is called the seat. Those three surfaces are each cut to a specific uh, fitment that, uh, that only an armorer can understand having gone through the whole process. It's a very detailed thing and uh, until you learn how to do it, you go through about a dozen of these things before you get it right. Uh, this was a part that I, this was a part that I had to consider for a long time for about the first year as an armorer. I used to order extra of these because uh, it, I, I, basically it was a very, very difficult thing to get the angles right. They have to be hand cut with a Barrett file and if you don't do it right you end up with all kinds, there's about five different uh, symptomatic problems that the gun will have from uh, trigger stoppage which is called a stubber, hammer jamming right up solid uh, or having uh, trigger and hammer slip where they just simply don't do what they're supposed to do. The trigger comes back and the hammer just sits there. There's all sorts of things, rough double action uh, and everything else. So it's a very, very critical part and so leave the, leave the sear alone. Don't try to polish it or anything else because it's been perfectly hand fitted at the factory. Next thing we want to do is we want to re remove the rebound slide. Now the rebound slide is, that's the, that's the device which returns the trigger back to battery. Now, <clears throat> the rebound slide coil spring comes from the factory with 17 coils. It's permissible to take as much as one to perhaps one and a half uh, turns of coil off of that spring on the inside, in other words, the, the, the forward portion of that uh, spring to uh, reduce the uh, to reduce any unnecessary stiffness of this uh, trigger. And that sometimes is done at the factory because they, they work within certain tolerances and they start out with a 17, pound, uh, a 17 coil spring and they can reduce that in order to get that down to where it feels uh, appropriate for the model. That And every one of these models had a, has a trigger weight specification for the trigger and for the, uh, and for the uh, weight of pull. So let's take that off and to remove that. Now, <coughs> there, is a, there is a tool that uh, I have made in the past, and I, I got it someplace, but I don't use it because it's just, it's just not necessary. There is a tool that you can make, which is an angle tool that will fit in behind the uh, stud here, and it will, compress, it will compress that spring, and you can lift out the, uh, you can lift out the um, rebound slide. But it's just as easy for a, for a person who's been used to doing it for so many years, it's just as easy to um, draw it in a little closer here so you can see what I'm doing, uh, position the camera. I want to get, I want to get underneath this part of the frame right here. I don't want to be anywhere near a finished portion of the frame. The, the polished side of my screwdriver now is, is the reason why it's polished and there's no sharp edges is because I can rest it right here on the on the skeletal part of the frame. And going behind this, I can go in behind this um, rebound slide and I simply lift straight up. You don't have to compress anything. I just simply use that as a fulcrum and keeping my finger on top of the rebound slide, lift it straight up. I'm gonna have to get my fingers in the way just so I can capture it. And when it gets above the stud, there's a, there's a stud here that holds that spring in place. When it gets behind that stud, make sure that you have control of that spring and lift it up and out. So that's it. Now, end frame revolvers, model 
uh, 25 up through 29, 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29, uh, typically they will have what's called another prod inside here that you won't find in other model guns generally, and that's called a uh, trigger stop rod. That trigger stop rod is to uh, limit rearward travel of uh, the trigger and to give it a little bit more of a target uh, type uh, feel. Now, this spring has been cut. I presume, uh, I, don't think that, I don't think that Mort ever did anything on this gun himself, so I presume that this was probably uh, cut at the factory uh, in order to fit it. I'll take the, re uh, the trigger stop rod out and we'll count the number of coils and we'll just see what they see what they did. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen and a half. There's fifteen and a half coils, so uh, the the worker, the armor at the factory kept it within specifications. So it's exactly what it, it should be. And that cut that cut end was, as I said, buried, buried inside the rebound slide. The rebound slide uh, on the side of it has got a pin that sticks out. This pin that sticks out here uh, functions uh, on your that functions on the uh, hammer block. The hammer block right here glides up and down on that and moves the hammer block up between the frame and uh, the hammer to prevent the hammer from falling unless the trigger is fully to the rear. So unless the trigger is fully to the rear, uh, this, this will uh, prevent the hammer from dropping on a cartridge. So it's very vital to keep that in place and don't be taking it out and monkeying with that. And I do not suggest that you uh, trim uh, any coils off of, uh, off of this rebound slide uh, any more than down to uh, 16 turns. Uh, and even then, uh, I don't recommend that you do it unless you understand uh, what it should feel like. Because you know, this is a lot of this. A lot of this is very, very uh, subjective. It, it's a matter of it's a matter of feel. It's an education of the finger that uh, that a person who has done it hundreds of times under, understands. And it's and it's something that anybody else would not know exactly what. Uh, the weight should feel like so you don't want to have you don't want to have trigger failing to return to battery because that's one of the most common issues with a gun that has been monkeyed with is that the trigger will not uh, fully return to battery and ends up with uh, ends up with having a, a stopped up double action or stopped up single action. Now we want to take the trigger out. Taking the trigger out is very very. This is extremely important. You see this bright shiny surface right here. This bright shiny surface, the, the back, the back of this uh, cylinder cheek. I have seen unfortunate examples where this hand has dragged along that beautiful blue and has scraped uh, an ugly scar on it. That hand is a very, very, very sharp object. And by the way, that's called. This is another nomenclature issue. That's called in Smith and Wesson country a hand is as uh, in Ruger's would call it a Paul P-A-W-L and Colt likewise a Paul but this is a hand and they get to they get to name what their part is you want to pull you want to pull that hand to the back with your you want to pull it back slightly with your fingernail and put your thumb get your thumb in front of now this is called this is called the throat of the hand this 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 little bump right here, this, this sticks out, that's called the throat of the hand, and uh, in other countries it's called the nose of the paw. But you want to get your thumb in front of that, in other words, to prevent it from uh, damaging that frame. Get your, get your thumb in front of it, and you want to cradle the gun firmly in both hands, and it, I would recommend that you, that you place the muzzle of the barrel on the bench so you can stabilize it. And with your with the index finger of your right hand, of your right hand, close to the frame of the gun, as close as you can get to the um, trigger stud, lift straight up without twisting, without bending, because that stud is unsupported, and you want to lift it straight up. You can see what I'm doing here. I'm, it's just going straight up in the air, and I can I can put it back down if I want and show you again. 
I want to lift it straight up off the stud without twisting, turning, bending, or anything. And when it's far away from the frame, then you can uh, separate the two so that one doesn't interact with the other and cause an ugly mess. Okay, here's the here's the hand. The hand is uh, there's a spring which is the leg of a spring which is around the base of that. Uh, this, there's a second pin in there. There's a there's a uh, axle pin, but there's also a pin which captures the spring, which gives it uh, torsion. In other words, keeps it forward and against the cylinder. Now, each of these hands is uh, got a has got a specific measurement. Uh, they they make them in many different widths at the factory uh, to correct. Uh, issues with regard to the timing of the gun and this interacts this interacts with what's called in Smith and Wesson guns the ratchets these are not notches these are called ratchets these ratchets right here are hand cut with a Barrett file a Barrett file is by the way a uh, very curious looking file made by Nicholson and uh, it's a spear shaped file and this is designed for cutting uh, the ratchets on cylinders and it's also used for uh, a few other a few other delicate purposes uh, on a, a Smith & Wesson handgun which we won't go into um, but anyway this this hand uh, is fit to the window the hand window on you can see it right here I can I can put my finger behind you can see how it I can get this see my finger back there that's the hand window so it's fit to the width of the hand window uh, and it has to have the correct width it has to have the the throat has to be the correct uh, length in order to reach uh, the the ratchets everything is very very precisely fit and uh, they're they're made it together married is what we call it so never ever ever polish this part this it, polishing this you'll end up with a, a gun with ruined timing it has to go back to the factory to have a uh, oversized hand put on it and it will have to be uh, the, sil the cylinder ratchets will have to be recut that's a major operation it's a very time-consuming laborious hand work it can't be done by machinery so uh, you know you don't want to you don't want to be doing that don't mess with your trigger your trigger just like your hammer there's nothing that you can do uh, to improve the trigger pull or the trigger weight or anything else by stoning or in any way uh, messing around with this uh, case hardened color case hardened uh, device this is all this is all milled on uh, this is all milled uh, very precisely it's hammer forged and uh, it's milled with long tower brooches that precisely that precisely cut uh, each of these surfaces and then they color case harden it which is a very very thin case hardening and you can't be cutting into that you're just going to destroy the hardness of it and the gun is going to continue to deteriorate and it's just simply not going to work because once you cut into any of those surfaces uh, you lose the relationship that was built into the gun from the factory that was uh, laboriously and painstakingly uh, put into it uh, to to remove that hand is of no value whatsoever because you're just going to have to uh, reposition that spring and that requires that you go in behind here with a screwdriver knowing what you're doing and pushing down as you push the hand back into place don't do it just leave the thing alone uh, you can set that aside now so we've got we've got all our parts uh, set aside and we've got our screws segregated now we're down to now we're down to this part of the frame here I'll back off once again <coughs> Now you can clearly see the bolt. The, the bolt re retracts uh, with the thumb piece. Uh, there's, no, there's no reason to remove that bolt. Um, the, only thing that, the only thing that you might want to remove it for is if you should have uh, accumulation of dirt or something like that, or if you've got a rusted gun where you've got to get it out and get things cleaned up. But this gun looks as if it's in perfectly uh, fine shape. Um, you know, the inside surface is nice and, nice and dry. Uh, and it's everything is functional. I don't see any wear whatsoever. Uh, so there's no there's no need to take that bolt out. Don't remove the cylinder stop. This cylinder stop has got this has got three different fitment areas. It's got uh, the top of the stop. 
it's got actually four. It's got the the width of the the width of the cylinder stop, and also the notch of the cylinder stop. There are two different cut points, so that can't be uh, that can't be monkey with. Don't be polishing any corners. Don't do anything like that because again, you're going to change the timing of the gun. And when you change the timing of this part, you change the timing of the trigger. The, then the hammer goes. Everything falls in uh, everything falls in an ugly pattern. So leave it alone. One of the most common, one of the most common things that I uh, see written up over the years, and it's been for years and years and years, is the polishing of parts that goes inside these guns. There's nothing to gain from that. These guns were designed to work as is. Uh, they have beautiful single and double action uh, it, that's built into it from the factory. Uh, there's nothing. There's nothing that you can do that will uh, improve its. Uh, action unless you are a trained armorer and understand the relationship of all these parts as a whole. It, they can't be they can't be regarded as one, uh, and you have to know where you're going. And if that you know if I've had people come to me and I've tuned I've tuned guns to to give them a little bit slipperier feel uh, for double action mode and things like that. And it's something which they taught us at the factory. But again, I can't presume to teach you 80, 80 hours worth of knowledge uh, on a video. So I'm not going to go there, um, because you're just going to simply botch up a gun. So leave it as as is. If you want to have it factory tuned, uh, Smith and Wesson will be glad to do that for you, and they'll give you a they'll give you a little bit of a, a, a buffed up feel. So to clean it out now, uh, this is you know, as I've said, mineral oil is a any oil is a very very good uh, cleaner. Uh, one drop. You see that I did that one simple drop of of oil inside inside the frame. That's all there is to it. I'm going to take my I'm going to take my brush now, and I'm just going to simply take that brush, and I'm going to work that oil into the pores of the metal and around the frame, all the recesses up into where the hammer is, and everything else. Now it's going to look. You're going to say, "Wow, that looks nice and." nice and oily. Well, that's a problem because I don't want it to look nice and oily. I, that's that's going to do nothing except attract dirt and carbon and uh, it's going to cause wear on those nice color case hardened parts and it's going to wear off that nice color case hardening and then you don't have a hardened part anymore. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take a few patches here, a wad of patches and I'm going to go in there and carefully without cutting myself you know you don't want to cut yourself on these sharp surfaces by the way if you ever 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 you know have the misfortune of uh, putting a drop getting a drop of blood on a gun uh, you better work on that thing right away drop everything that you're doing and wash that blood off immediately because blood will uh, pit that gun before you can even be before you can even say so it's <coughs> blood is uh, it, it, it's, it's saltier than salt water, and that will pit the gun uh, irreparably and put a mark on that bluing before you can get it off. So you got post haste, you got to get blood off. So that's a little side note. If you're a deer hunter and you're you're gutting your deer, keep your gun far away from uh, any spattering blood. Okay, so we're going to go in there and clean off any of that oil. All oil should be cleaned off. You say, well, why, why am I putting oil on and then wiping it off? Well, I'm putting oil on and I'm not wiping it off. I'm wiping off everything that you can see. But the only way you can get oil off metal is to degrease it. And I'm not using any degreases. I'm simply wiping it off with a patch. That will leave, uh, enough, that will leave enough protection on that metal for the next 50 years. I mean, there's no, there's, there's no way that oil is going to go away unless I use solvents on the gun which will displace the oil. Uh, in other words, uh, oil degreases and that would uh, take it away. But if you use things like Hoppy's number no. 9 or, or plain mineral spirits or something like that, uh, you know, it, it's going to always it's going to always leave uh, some protective uh, oil in us that will protect that finish. So that's all you should do. Continue the same way with all the other parts. In other words, wipe the other parts down. Use solvent if you need to. Mineral spirits. When I say mineral spirits, just talking about plain old, you know, mineral spirits like this. Or you can use uh, Hoppy's number nine. 
like that. If you're using REM oil, you're using mineral spirits. You're using mineral spirits that's mixed with other compounds, you know, with, with mineral oil and things like that. It's, it's just, it's all the same thing, you know. Um, if you use ballast oil, you're using uh, basically a salad dressing. I don't care to use salad dressing on my gun. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a water-soluble, uh, it's a water-soluble oil, which doesn't make any sense. If you're going to, you know, oil shouldn't be water-soluble. If it's water-soluble, it means that it washes off. Now, I've cleaned all the parts. We'll say that I've cleaned them all. Now I want to make sure that I have the uh, cylinder clean and the yoke. Remove the cylinder from the yoke by pulling it straight out. If there's any, if there's any tightness, just simply turn it as you back it off. It could have carbon in it that will cause tightness that will uh, impinge on it. You don't want to do slapping around or banging on it or hitting it with a mallet or a babbit or anything like that. Just, just simply back it off by, by sliding it off. Now, <coughs> again, there are different fitment purposes, uh, fitment areas on this, uh, on the barrel of the cylinder. Uh, the relationship of the cylinder and uh, the frame and the cylinder to the yoke and the yoke to the frame are all inter, uh, interrelated and uh, separately dependent upon one another and to themselves. And it can't be messed with. So uh, set that safely aside and now you want to just inspect and make sure that your uh, extractor rod this is called this is not called a base pin or a center rod or anything else this is called an extractor rod the outer portion is extract extractor rod the inside pin that you can see in there is the center pin and that's the part that protrudes from the uh, from the uh, rear of the cylinder uh, between the notches uh, the ratchets rather now you have your extractor this is not called an ejector star or anything else is called uh, this is called the extractor under the extractor is uh, are two pins those two pins uh, fit into these holes these two holes in the extractor check to make sure that you that you have those pins in there those pins uh, have been known to get bent and wiped out if they if they have been bent and wiped out it means that somebody has uh, tried to tighten this uh, tighten this rod, this this uh, extractor uh, rod, with a pair of pliers or a vise or something like that, not knowing what they were doing, and they twisted those pins right off and they they damaged them. Uh, that will upset your timing of your gun. Uh, it's going to cause all kinds of havoc. You can't tighten this. You can't tighten this up unless you know what you're doing. Uh, the the more recent the more recent manufacturers of this particular uh, style. Smith & Wesson uh, have gone to left-hand threads on this rod, and if you don't know which way you're supposed to turn this rod, you're going you're gonna to have frustration. So there's, there's left-hand threads and there's right-hand threads, depending on the years that it was manufactured. Don't, under any circumstances, apply a pair of pliers to this or a vise to it or anything like that, and don't try to tighten it up yourself. It has to go back to the factory or to an armorer who understands how to properly tighten this without wiping out uh, this extractor. Enough said. Uh, you can you can uh, use solvents to uh, you know clean that out, flush it out with mineral spirits or whatever, uh, or with hoppies, and that will that will clean out any carbon <coughs> and dry it out with an air hose. That's the best thing to do, making sure that your air hose isn't dispersing water because water does build up in uh, air uh, air compressors. So uh, when you're all done, uh, it should it should. When it's not in the when it's not inside the yoke, it's going to feel like it's dragging, um, and the yoke straightens it out and gives it that nice glossy feel. So you can it's perfectly acceptable to place one one drop of oil right here at this juncture and to work that work that a few times until that works in and then wipe the wipe the excess oil off get it off of there you don't want any you don't want any visible oil on any gun whatsoever the oil that's on there is is uh, all that's necessary whatever oil is embedded microscopically will uh, protect that gun perfectly against all attacks okay so now 
There's one other place where you can you can put one drop of oil, and that's right here in the track of there's a there's a groove in this in this side of the uh, extractor. You can place one drop, just one please, and work that back and forth. That will clean out any carbon. That will get rid of any carbon. Or if it's really carboned up, you can use some Hoppies number nine and work that in there. And then again, you know, uh, get rid of get rid of any visible oil afterwards. You don't want to have any oil whatsoever built up or sitting on those mating surfaces because that's going to create oil has a oil has a sufficient viscosity to affect the uh, barrel gap, the cylinder and uh, chamber, the, the cylinder and um, forcing cone gap. The gap on a uh, Smith & Wesson is at the factory three thousandths of an inch, which will, uh, and it's tolerable to have it up to six thousandths of an inch. Uh, it's not supposed to be, it's not supposed to be uh, less than 3,000 inch of an inch or it will, the cylinder will cramp and you'll have basically the cylinder, the face of the cylinder rubbing against uh, the rear of the barrel and that will, that will cause your uh, double action and your single action pull to uh, basically be hindered and that will really tear up uh, all kinds of parts inside the gun including the cylinder notches. And that's one thing you don't want to do. You don't want to have any resistance to uh, that trigger squeeze. So keep any oils out from underneath that. Again, wipe them off carefully. Get that stuff out of there. Uh, you're only protecting metal. Okay, dry. These are your cylinder notches right here. These cylinder notches, you want to check those and make sure that they're not torn. You don't want to have, you don't want to have a uh, cylinder where the notches are torn, no matter whose brand it is. Um, a lot of torn notches come from, uh, you know, aggressively slapping the cylinder uh, back inside the frame. The cylinder should be placed inside the frame, locked inside the frame physically with, with the other hand. It should never be slapped into place. In other words, just rotate it in your wrist with that, you know, quick draw method, slapping it into place like John Wayne or anything. That that will that will tear these ratchets up, tear up tear up your ratchets and tear up your cylinder notches. Uh, and it will really completely destroy your cylinder. So uh, always always uh, even in even in heated even in heated uh, combat situations. Uh, you know, it, it, once you learn how to properly handle a revolver, uh, it, it will get handled even in hasty situations the way it ought to be. Okay, so we've pretty much got the whole thing down. Um, there are there are just a few things that you want to make sure you clean up on the uh, on the gun. Uh, make sure you clean up the. This is a the very dirty area right in here. Uh, you can work on that. You can use you can use cotton swabs with you know use cotton swabs with uh, solvent and things like that in order to work those recesses and get any carbon out. But then also uh, dry them off afterwards so that you can return it back to uh, original condition. Remember when I took this apart, this is a this is a gun that was made in 1976, and everything was bright and clean inside. It wasn't slathered with oil, didn't have oil flowing through it, and everything is bright, sharp, and clean, just the way it came out of the factory. So let's get it back together. Okay, I've swung the uh, camera around so you can see what's going on here. On the trigger, this rod that sticks out behind, that's got a rounded head on it, that's called the trigger lever. The trigger lever engages the rebound slide by going into the it goes into this pocket in the back of the rebound slide you can see there's a hole back there uh, that's, that's bored into it and there's also a tab and that tab engages the two sides it gets between the two sides of the trigger the rear of the trigger so what we want to do is make sure that that trigger lever is up and uh, positioned so that it's free of the it's free of the frame. And you don't want to get it down. It's very common uh, to uh, miss and get that trigger lever trapped uh, where it can't do any good. Hold on to the frame like this. In other words, just cradle it comfortably. This is very important to make sure that you retain control of the front, the throat of that uh, hand. That hand will wipe out this cheek piece right here and you'll end up with a very bad, badly uh, scarred up gun. Uh, place 
your thumb underneath. This thumb right here of my right hand is positioned underneath the trigger lever to keep it in the upward position. I need to put I need to put that on top of the shelf here. While I pull back on the hand, and I have my fingers pinched around the trigger, around the around the hook of the trigger, lower it down with the hand pulled to the rear and guarded. Lower it straight down onto that trigger stud. That's all there is to it. You know, sometimes people wonder, how do they do that? Well, that's how they do that. They just simply lift it off with the thumb guarding that uh, thumb guarding that hand, and they place it back down with the thumb behind and underneath the trigger lever, and drop it straight down onto onto that stud. And then when it's fully down, only then let the hand go through the window. Be sure that the hand goes through the window and doesn't slide against this part right here. That is, you know, don't use this as a, as a fulcrum to guide that hand back into its place. Now, the trigger should have free movement, unimpeded movement, and that cylinder stop should capture and hook right around uh, the front of that trigger hook. That's all there is to it. Now we want to have the uh, we want to have the rebound slide back in place because that what returns the trigger back to battery. To replace that into position, you want to be sure that your that your pin, the side the pin on the side here which engages your uh, hammer block, that should be facing upward, and the spring should be toward you. Be sure that if you have a model uh, with the trigger stop rod, that the trigger stop rod is inserted with the crowned end, the rounded end buried inside the trigger inside the um, spring and make sure you spring the cut end if you have a cut end that the spring cut end is inside also you want to have the finished end of the coil uh, facing outward against this stud this stud right here that's uh, behind the uh, recoil block is the recoil slide rebound slide rather is called the rebound slide stud the purpose of that stud is to, to uh, press this spring forward and to re re retain it in position and give it torsion. So we're going to place that we're going to place that into position just like that. Now more blood is let during this particular procedure than in any of anything else. You've got to use extreme care, and if you stab yourself. You know, and it's been done so often. If you stab yourself with a screwdriver, you got to be very sure. Take the thing apart and make sure you wash it off post haste without delay. Any blood left on that gun will immediately corrode it before you can even blink an eye. Don't go to the sink. Don't go getting anything. Just immediately get some solvent, get some stuff on there quickly, and wipe it off and, and rub it off as much as you can. We want to push down with my left index finger on top of that on top of that rebound slide as I push forward on that the rear of that spring once I get the rear of the spring so that it's down below the top of that uh, rebound slide stud then I just simply press down with the screwdriver on top of the spring I put this I put the screwdriver blade I put the screwdriver blade right directly on top of that spring and push it straight down and it'll ride right down on the back of that uh, stud. Make sure that you don't get that stud between any coils. Now, <coughs> be sure be sure that it's seating, uh, seated flat all the way in. When you have the side plate off, always use your left, your left thumb is a temporary side plate. This left thumb here is always a temporary side plate when you're working things. So place your left thumb on top of that on top of that rebound slide to hold it down so that it doesn't ride up. And make sure that your thumb is also uh, being conscious of all these other parts to make sure that they don't slide up and pop out of position and scar things. Okay, so that's operating in good condition. That should be, that should be moving that hand up, in, up inside that window straight up and down. Okay, the next thing is your hammer. Replacing your hammer is very, very simple, and by now you should have cleaned uh, any surfaces. Make sure that your sear is working correctly. Make sure that it's got good 
uh, spring tension so that it pops right back out. It shouldn't have any cut coils or anything like that. Uh, there should be no there should be no issues with movement. This is called the stirrup. The stirrup right here has to be positioned upward. Uh, so when you put it back together, I you know an armorer will typically tip the gun upside down to keep that stirrup into position. But what I'm going to do here to show you what I'm doing, again, this is all a matter of hand gymnastics. Take the hammer in your forefinger, your index finger, and your thumb. With your second finger, make sure that that stirrup is up and cradled inside of the rear curve of that uh, hammer. With my right hand, I want to pull back on the uh, trigger. That's the only way the hammer will go into place. With the hammer fully back, I want to keep, uh, with the trigger fully back, I want to keep the hammer in the rearward position. Now, at the same time, my second, my, my bird finger, we're going to call it, I want to use that finger and get that between the cheek of uh, the opposite side of the revolver and the thumb piece and I want to pull that bolt I want to pull that bolt to the rear so pull the bolt to the rear pull the trigger now with this pinched between I so I've got my right index finger pulling on the trigger my left bird finger is pulling back on the uh, thumb piece uh, I have rotated the, the stirrup uh, into the upper position and I'm pulling the hammer back. Imagine I'm pulling the hammer back and it's, if you can see the front of that, the lower portion of that hammer is dropping down in the recess between the, between this portion of the, the hand right here. So in other words, it's got to clear. The only place it's going to go in is right into this recess right in here. So I've got to pretend basically I'm, I'm functioning this gun in the completed uh, double action mode. So again, with my, with my bird finger, my middle finger, pulling that thumb piece to the rear, and I'm lifting straight up and down, and I'm replacing straight up and down. Don't twist, turn, torque, or bend, or anything else. It just slides straight down on top of that stud. Drop the hammer with your thumb, release the finger on the trigger. That's all there is to it. Using your thumb as a, using your thumb as a uh, trigger, uh, as a side plate, Pull the uh, bolt to the rear with your thumb piece, and you can you can use your thumb as a mainspring, and you can cycle the action, and you can check it out. Everything should work and cycle nice and smoothly. Next thing is to get my uh, mainspring back into place. Very very simple, but it can cause frustrations. Uh, with my left thumb, hold the stirrup in place while I engage. Uh, the top of the spring, it goes, the, the spring contour fits the same contour as the frame of the gun. It's in the same, it's in the same contour. Place it down into the, into the slot at the bottom of the grip frame. This is where you pinch, you pinch right here with your, with your thumb and a finger. And all I do now is simply screw my strain screw straight in. Once it's captured and it's not going anywhere, make sure I guard that. Make sure I guard that screw very carefully, so that it doesn't uh, slip. And rotate it all the way in and bottom it out. Never, ever, ever, ever back that out uh, to tune up your gun uh, to tune up a double action pull. Never, ever, ever cut off any material on that strain screw. That strain screw has been fitted to have a specific amount of torque on that spring. And if you reduce it, you're just simply killing the reliability of a gun. That's all you're doing. Okay, with replacing the side plate is a very, very easy maneuver. If you've got one of the if you've got one of the more common models which has this ear at the top rather than a screw, uh, then that simply fits that simply fits underneath this section right here. There's a there's a little pocket for that. So we want to place that we want to place that underneath. But before we do, want to take your hammer block, drop it down onto that, drop it down onto that pin right here. It's about midway. 
in order to get it to line up nicely, you want to just have that pin positioned just about midway. In other words, neither all the way up or all the way down. It's not a very critical thing. And that, <coughs> that hammer block has got to ride inside this slot right here. I have a little bit of oil left on that brush. I can, you know, use, use that to uh, apply a little bit of protective oil on the inside of that uh, side plate. That's more than sufficient. That has, that has completely waterproofed it and provided plenty of protection. Uh, so cradling the gun like that, simply place the ear. There you go. You get you get the whole thing positioned correctly and then just press it gently press it gently into place I think while I was while I was talking it got out of the slot so just simply press it gently into place now this is this is important you want to take the back side of a plastic of a plastic screwdriver and you don't want to use something with high leverage you don't want to be using one of these gizmos because this is going to cause this is going to cause distortion of the gun. All I'm doing here is simply tapping on top of those screws just to seat just to seat that side plate. The reason I'm doing that is because I don't want to use the screws as a uh, lever to uh, bottom that uh, plate out because you're going to be basically wearing on the threads of those screws unnecessarily. Those are attachment screws. Those are not. Those are those are fine threads on them. So you don't want to be wearing out the threads and uh, causing uh, problems like that. So you simply tap it gently. Not a big deal. Once it's flush, it's flush. You don't want to hammer it into place. Now I want to make sure I have my uh, position number three screw, my flat head screw. Put that in. Now when you order screws, you don't order them called a position number three or position number two or one screw. They're called flathead side plate screw or crowned side plate screws. That's all they are. Now there is uh, a way of alleviating some uh, end shake in the yoke, and I'm going to describe that in a second, so stay tuned. But I'm, when I'm placing, when I'm placing my screws in, always get in the habit of placing your thumb adjacent to the screw hole, adjacent to the screw head, and guard that, my glasses here, uh, guard that screwdriver to keep it from slipping and sliding, and always use your screwdriver perpendicular to the slot. Don't let it get uh, tipped sideways. And turn the screw in, don't torque it, all you do is simply bottom it out, and that's it. Give it a nudge, and it's, it's tight. You don't want to keep on t tightening it. There's no torquing. You don't, you don't want to get out your wheel of torque screwdriver or anything like that. Just simply put the screws in there and they hold in place forever. Now, this is the, again now, this is the reverse of the procedure that we did before. Notice that there's a funny ear on the back corner here of your uh, cylinder window. That ear retains the cylinder when it's swung out of the frame and that and that ear has to clear the back surface of uh, the cylinder now <clears throat> what we want to do is we want to position we want to position the cylinder thusly and slide the yoke uh, into position if I, now if I see any I just saw some I just saw something that's very ugly here I saw some glistening oil get that off that get that off of there you don't want that on there uh, that's that's only going to collect carbon and junk and then you're going to have a sticky cylinder. You don't need it. It's, there's plenty of oil on there. It can only be removed now with, um, with detergent, uh, with a degreaser. So what I want to do is I want to slide the yoke in into the frame right here. I want to slide that into the frame like, like this while the cylinder is sitting uh, adjacent to the window. That's that's the goal. So when my hands disappear, you'll know exactly what I did. So we're going to take we're going to take the cylinder yoke and position the cylinder over the window with the yoke into its uh, into its 
recessed opening and slide the yoke back into place just like that. That's all there is to it. I don't use the cylinder to drag into position. Close it up. Now we want to re replace the yoke screw. Again guarding the guarding the screwdriver with my thumb. Make sure that I don't slip. You can you can watch and feel and as that screwdriver wants to walk sideways out of the slot your thumb is there to reposition it and use it as a centering tool. So you know the gun care is a lot simpler than most people make it out to be. It's not a it's not a big deal. Okay now that we've got it now that we've got it functioning correctly I'm going to go over that issue of uh, end shake. <coughs> Let's widen up this screen here so you can see. There are end shake is the movement the movement forward and back of the cylinder. There are two forms. There's end shake of the yoke and there's end shake of the cylinder. End shake of the cylinder is not something that a, that a uh, person can fix on his own. Yes, I know that there are bushings that are sold by brown elves and things like that to take up the slack in the uh, cylinder. That's not the appropriate way to fix things because those bushings come in different thicknesses. You can end up jamming up your cylinder and if those bushings should split, you have parts in there that will start rubbing around and wipe things out. That's not the way it's fixed. They don't, at the factory, they're not fixed with bushings. They're fixed by changing the dimensions of, and that's a magilla I'm not going to get into, by stretching the yoke and uh, in, in very uh, sophisticated ways. The simple way to determine if you have end shake is to place, your, place the gun on a bench and to move the cylinder back and forth, in other words, toward the muzzle and back again. If you feel it going bing, bang, bing, bang, bing, bang, it's moving back and forth, it means you have end shake. Now, to determine if it's end shake of the yoke, place your finger right here and feel this seam. There's a seam between the frame and the yoke. And if you feel the movement there, that's, you have, at least you have some end shake yoke. It could be a combination of the two, but you have some end shake, end shake of the yoke. That can be resolved very frequently by swapping the number one screw for the number two screw. This screw has not been married and fitted so you can place that screw in this screw position and very frequently that will take up some of that slack and repair it. If that's not sufficient and you still feel movement at the front of the frame then you can call the factory and you can ask them for what's called, it's not cataloged, uh, armorers know about this part, you can ask the people at customer service if they will send you a part called end shake screw yoke. Sounds like a Chinese restaurant uh, dish. It's called end shake screw yoke. If you ask for end shake screw yoke, they will, they will probably send you a part which is a screw that's just like this one except it's thicker in the front end and it's identified by spiral marks that look like uh, extensions of the thread that will take up quite a lot of slack in the average uh, end shake of a yoke. Again, if you have end shake, if end shake still persists and it's no longer in the front of the frame here at the yoke, it means you have end shake of the cylinder. It's got to go back to the factory for repair. That's the only way around it. A little bit of end shake uh, is, is a lot because end shake uh, always moves the cylinder forward. There's only three thousandths of an inch gap here at the cylinder. Three thousandths of an inch is less than the thickness of a piece of uh, printer paper. This uh, 20 pound printer paper is four thousandths of an inch, so it's a very small cylinder gap. Now some departments have, you know, some departments have, uh, in order to maintain uh, high reliability, uh, some departments actually order their guns or their armor will increase that cylinder gap so that they have a little bit more gap, more like six or eight thousandths of an inch. It creates a lower velocity cartridge naturally and you have a lot more gas blow by and things like that, but there's less likelihood of cylinder drag on the uh, rear of the barrel. But that's not something that, that's not something that I recommend that anybody do. It's, it's, it's actually destructive to the uh, quality of the gun, so just leave it alone. Um, now we want to make sure that the double action is in good condition. It should, it should come back nice and smooth without any, without any grittiness or without any uh, stoppage. 
Any, anything where it stops up like in jams is called a stub, a stubber, and that means that uh, that sear has to be uh, replaced and refitted. So that means that somebody monkeyed around with that uh, sear or the gun perhaps was dropped. Uh, in, and it is important to make sure that your hammer rotates smoothly to the rear in single action. Make sure that you make sure that your cylinder will not open when it's in the cocked position. That means that your bolt is working correctly, and it means that uh, it means that that function is as it should be. You should have what's called wink. That means if you hold the hammer forward, you should have some movement of the trigger, the trigger wink, and you want to have some hammer wink. You want to cock it to the rear and have slight amount of travel without having over travel. The frame is actually fitted to the hammer. The, f the frame is fitted to the hammer with a very educated file which mates that uh, over travel to make sure that you have a good capture of the, uh, of the trigger to hammer relationship but without it pulling back so far that it loses the hammer. If, if, the, if the trigger and hammer uh, go by one another it's a uh, big time problem because now you've got a now you've got a frame that's uh, cut too far so that should never be monkeyed with the gun should sing in other words with the hammer with the hammer pulled partly to the rear you should feel a nice smooth clicking and it shouldn't it shouldn't drag and it, you shouldn't feel as if it's coming around a uh, halfway and then stopping uh, the other half it, because that indicates that you have a bent center pin, uh, or it means that you have uh, perhaps a loose uh, extractor rod. A loose extractor rod will cause no end of problems because that's going to that's going to cause over uh, that's going to cause over tightness on this end of the uh, on this end of the uh, locking system. This is called the locking bolt down here. This little this little silver this little silver rod that's beveled on the side that's uh, inside the um, shroud. That's called the locking bolt. Um, sometimes people monkey around with that uh, to, to make it smoother and everything. And when they when they polish that, they end up they end up changing the length and, and altering a very important amount of uh, gauging that has been done when this was fitted. So again, just check, make sure that you have make sure it sings without dragging. Make sure now this is another check. You want to check push your push your thumb piece forward as you open and close and move it forward on each of the charge holes and it should it should lock on that cylinder stop on each one of those charge holes and it should have slight movement it should not be tight it should not be tight it, this is this is a fallacy with a Smith & Wesson revolver if there's not slight movement you're gonna have a gun that locks up on you and it's gonna cause problems it should always have slight it should always have slight movement but it should be consistent and the same from one to the other if it's excessive then you're gonna have shaving lead you're gonna have lead shaving at the uh, breech cone so you don't want to have excessive movement and excessive movement is usually because somebody has uh, torn those notches. This is what you don't want to do. You don't want to slap that gun together and get that, you know, let that s cylinder slap home. You don't want to slap it together like that, which I see so often. That's a very amateurish butcher maneuver. Always close it tight with your, with just close it tight. Don't slap it shut with anything more than just simply that force right there. The, pr the proper way to load a double action revolver is to have your two center fingers uh, through the window. That's the proper way to load it. This is not this is not the proper way to load a double action revolver. This is how you load a double action revolver because this this means the hand goes right back where it's supposed to. As soon as it's closed, you can start shooting. So this is this is how you open it. This is how you close it and shoot it. Open it, close it and shoot it. That's it. Not like this, reaching around and all these things. That's not what you do. I'm trying to also teach you how to be a good shot and to and to uh, you know have good body mechanics when you're shooting. It gives you it gives you more uh, consistent shooting feel. This thumb here, boom. That's how you that's how you eject cartridges. Don't bash it like that. That can bend that can bend that uh, rod. 
If you bend that rod, you're going to have real problems, and it has to go back to the factory, and it's got to, they got to strap that cylinder up again. And that's, that's uh, another hours of labor. So uh, that's all you need to do. Finally, finish it up with a wipe of my lightly oiled cloth. What do I oil that with? That's oiled with the same oil that I wiped inside uh, the gun. It's just simply mineral oil. I got a couple of tablespoons of mineral oil just distributed in this nice soft cotton. This is this is cotton flannel that's uh, you know that's used for making uh, pajamas for for toddlers. It's the same stuff that you get uh, and I made a 20 inch square that I cut on the edge with pinking shears so that they're nice and uh, they don't ravel. My grandmother's pinking shears, I use them for that. And wipe up that frame nice and nice and clean. And you can see it's got this beautiful, you know, it's it's almost iridescent. When I when I wipe it with that now I can see that beautiful iridescent uh, Smith and Wesson glow. It just looks beautiful. So wipe it up especially where uh, your, your hand grips, your stocks are going to be positioned. And I'm, I'm going to not touch the frame because I now have got a, I've got a nice clean frame. I've got my body salts wiped off of the skeletal portion of the grip. And I'll simply take those stocks without touching anything. Place that back into position. Place that back into position and screw it down. Guarding that screwdriver with my thumb. Always just get in the habit of always placing your thing. It's a, it's a, you know, when I see somebody doing this, I know that they're an amateur. Always do this. Get your thumb right, you know, cozy with that screwdriver. Feel that screwdriver working and keep things perpendicular, not angled. Angled uh, screwdrivers always walk sideways, and when they do, they take wood and metal and everything else with them. Not over tight, just tighten it down comfortably snug, and that's it. I got a beautiful, doesn't get any better than that. The trigger weight on Smith & Wessons is typically uh, two and three quarter to four pounds. Two and three quarter on a K-frame uh, target gun, and it's up to four pounds on a gun of this sort. It should support the weight of the gun, which is what I'm doing right now. I'm supporting, I'm actually, I've got this pulled, I've got this hammer pulled back, it's in single action mode, and I can support the weight of the gun and jostle it around on that trigger. That's important. If I can't do that, I've got an unsafe Smith & Wesson. That is a beautiful, crisp, clean, that, that trigger couldn't break any nicer than that. That is just as slick as can be. Uh, that feels like a, you know, to, to, the average, to the average neophyte, that would feel like a, a hair trigger. That's all you want. That's, that's what the name of the game is. Well, I wish to thank my good friend and neighbor, Mort, for being so kind enough to let me borrow his Model 25-5 Smith & Wesson chambered in 45 Colt. What a fantastic masterpiece. What a classic of art and human workmanship. Thank you for watching and God bless.